The computer, our modern day revolution. We use it every day, from listening to music, to editing photos, to viewing video. But where did our first computers come from? People. I'm a computer, you're a computer, we're all computers. Computer was originally a job title that described people doing repetitive calculations. A lot of history went into this beauty, coming from inventions that were used to help people in mathematical calculations, like the abacus, Napier's bones, and the pascaline. All of these aided in addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. In 1822, Charles Babbage invented the steam-powered difference machine, which would be able to compute logarithm tables. Other inventions were machines that created punched cards. These punched cards were used for a gas bill, or as we know it today, for voting. One of these machines was the Hollerith Desk, which is created by Herman Hollerith. You may know him as the man who created IBM. IBM continued to develop the calculator for sale to businesses to help with financial accounting and inventory accounting. In 1944, IBM partnered up with Harvard to create the Harvard Mark I. It was the first programmable digital computer in the U.S. It was not purely electronic, though. It was constructed out of switches, relays, rotating shafts, and clutches. In 1937, the earliest attempts to build an all-electronic digital computer was built by J.V. Atenasaw. This machine was the first to store data on a charge on a capacitor, which is how today's computers store information in their main memory, or RAM. Another major invention towards the model computer was the Colossus, built during World War II by Britain for the purpose of breaking the cryptographic codes used by Germany. In 1941, Conrad Zeus invented the Z3, his third machine. It was probably the first operational, general-purpose, programmable, software-controlled digital computer. 1943 to 1945, the ENIAC was created. It stood for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator. It was created by funding from the War Department promising that it could replace all women that were employed calculating the firing tables for the Army's artillery guns. By the end of the 1950s, computers were no longer one-of-a-kind hand-built devices. Although the ENIAC was unquestionably the origin of U.S. commercial computer industry, by 1955, IBM was selling more personal computers. Computers had been incredibly expensive because they required so much hand assembly. In 1976, the Apple I sold for only $600 as a do-it-yourself kit. In the 1990s, a university student would typically own their own computer. This was a result of the transformation of the microprocessor. In 1971, Intel was the first to develop the microprocessor. They were the first to succeed in cramming an entire computer onto a single chip. This began the revolution of the personal computer. MITS Altair was one of the first kit-based microcomputers. Although it wasn't the first microcomputer, it was the first of the industry. Soon after came the MSI 880. It was better built and had a better power supply, although it was very similar to the Altair. In 1977, processor technology designed the Soul computer. The Soul had a video terminal built in, only requiring a video monitor. It came in a very attractive case with walnut wood sides. The Soul became a very popular computer that influenced the design of future computers. Ah, now for the first true quote unquote personal computer, the Apple II. Factory built, inexpensive, and easy to learn and use provided with the most extensive set of software and low-cost floppy disks. The Apple II was also the first personal computer capable of color graphics and easy modem operation. Rivaling the Apple II was Radio Shack's TRS-80, selling for about $500 complete with video monitor. It took the personal computer market by storm. Using a fast Z80 processor, it used a cassette recorder for program and data storage. In 1983, Radio Shack later came out with the first practical laptop, the Model 100. You know what's next. Progression of technology means progression of the computer. As time goes on, the computer will become smaller and more compact until it resembles our laptops and desktops today. Growing up in the computer age, it's easy to forget where this great technology came from. Now that you know, I hope you can properly thank the inventors and inventions that indirectly bestowed upon you 
your new Apple MacBooks that our school lovingly gave us. Here is the amazing Abacus, the original retro calculator. This is the Chinese version with two beads in the upper deck and five beads below. The Chinese Abacus has been in use for over 800 years. Amazing! And the roots of the Abacus go back far further than that. The Romans used a version, and the roots go back even to the clever Mesopotamians. Amazingly, the Abacus is still widely used today throughout Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Why? Because the Abacus is surprisingly powerful and intuitively easy to use. Now this is the Japanese version called the Soroban. It has heavenly beads in the upper deck and earthly beads in the lower deck. The heavenly beads are worth five and the earthly beads are worth one. Now we only count beads when they are in the middle position of the abacus. And the abacus is read in exactly the same way you read a modern digital calculator from left to right and with one column per unit. You'll see that in just a second. I'm going to enter the number 1,234 euros and 56 cents. So we're going to do 1,234 euros and 56 cents. Here is a little visual aid. So now let's add a number to that. I am going to add 1,111 euros and 11 cents. So I'm just going to add one all the way across the board. Now we're going to have only one little tricky operation and you'll see how that works in just a second. Okay, here we go. I'm going to add 1,111. Oh, now we've got the tough part. I've already got four beads up here, but I need to add one. So I'm going to subtract four and add five. That's the 11, and now we're going to do the 11 cents. So add one and add one. And so what's our result? It is 2,345 euros, 67 cents. Now let's just quickly add another number. We're going to add 7,654 euros and 32 cents. So I'm going to add seven. I'm going to add six. Five, four, three, and two. Now we have 9,999 euros and 99 cents. What do you think we're going to do next? We're going to add one to that. And now we're going to see the carry operation in full effect. I need to add one to this column here. Well, to add one, we do a very simple thing. We're going to take away nine from this column and add one to the next column. So watch this. Take away nine, add one. Same problem. Take away 9, add 1. Same thing. 9, 9, 9, and 1. So what's our answer? It's very simple. It is 10,000 euros. If you ever get a chance, you should watch an expert abacus user watch their fingers flying across the keyboard as they add numbers. They'll do the multiplication on one side and bring the result over to the right side before your eyes can even focus on their fingers. It's amazing. Here is our base piece, with these two wooden pieces fixed to the backing. The vertical piece is numbered 2 through 0. On the right are free bones, which are unattached and able to swap and flip. Say you want to do 485 times 3. On the 3 row, the number on the very right is the 1's digit of the result. The next two numbers are together inside of a parallelogram. Added together, they form the 10's digit. The sum of the next two numbers, also in a parallelogram, forms the hundreds digit, and the last number is the thousands digit. Reading from left to right, the result of 485 times 3 equals 1,455. You can multiply three digit, two digit, or four digit numbers, and the free bones can be interchanged in any fashion. The blank bar next to the zero along the bottom indicates that all numbers times zero equals zero. If the numbers inside a parallelogram add up to more than 10, you carry the 1 over to the next highest parallelogram and leave the 1's digit. For example, in 4875 times 7, the 1's digit is 5, the 10's digit is 2, and the 100's digit is 1.
Like this, uh, 